Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of our Women in Preservation Symposium presented by the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America and the Smithsonian Institution. Um, before we get started on the Advocacy is Action panel, I'd like to just uh, point out that we have a Q&A box available to type in your questions and we'll be uh, having a Q&A session at the end of the panel. But please feel free to type in your questions as you think of them. You don't have to wait until the very end of the panel. Um, so welcome to the Advocacy is Action panel. So. That title, why the title? Well, it seems like preservation is all about advocacy, right? Um, I was thrilled to chair this session because it seems like my whole career has been about advocacy for seemingly unlikely things, like protecting cultural heritage in the middle of an armed conflict or in the immediate aftermath of a huge disaster. Very unlikely, right? Um, after the looting of the Iraq National Museum during the U.S. invasion in 2003, I served as an arts, monuments, and archives officer to try to help the museum get back on its feet and to help the Ministry of Culture resume its duties. I found myself advocating after that for U.S. ratification of the 1954 Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in Armed Conflict, and better and more training for US military personnel deploying around the world. I worked with several women colleagues like Dr. Patty Gerstenblith and Dr. Nancy Wilkie to found the US Committee of the Blue Shield to help implement the 1954 Hague Convention. I hope you'll tune in at one o'clock this afternoon to hear more about the Blue Shield with Dr. Patty Gerstenblith. With the ratification of the Hague Convention accomplished in 2009, I found myself advocating for the rescue of cultural heritage after the terrible 2010 Haiti earthquake. I found a sympathetic ear with the Smithsonian. After the earthquake killed more than 200,000 people, SCRI began. In a great feat of advocacy, Dr. Richard Curran, the Smithsonian oh. Undersecretary of History, Art, and Culture at the time, organized help for Haitian colleagues with the Haiti Cultural Recovery Project. In a feat of great advocacy, again, Dr. Curran worked alongside our colleagues to convince donors and government agencies, both in Haiti and in the United States, that humanitarian response should immediately be followed by a response for cultural heritage to help Haiti's galleries, libraries, archives, and museums that support Haiti as an economic and social driver. After that experience, the Smithsonian continued to enthusiastically advocate for and develop further capacity to coordinate and participate in emergency preparedness and disaster recovery for cultural heritage worldwide, resulting in the creation of the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative. To learn more about the origins of SCRI, I hope you'll stay tuned for Dr. Richard Curran's flash talk, Rescuing History from War and Nature, immediately after this session. Today, SCRI's projects include cultural rescue work in Iraq, Syria, Mali, Nepal, the Bahamas, and around the United States, as well as disaster risk management training for Haitian, or sorry, for heritage colleagues, first responders, and military personnel around the world. We're very proud to partner with FEMA for the Heritage Emergency National Task Force and to serve on the Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee, which is chaired by the US Department of State. Within those activities, we're always trying to raise awareness for integrating cultural heritage into disaster risk management frameworks, both internationally and in the United States. We've also been a longtime advocate for the protection of cultural property in armed conflict. SCRI has an agreement with the US Army Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command to provide training and support for today's Army monuments men and women. This is just part of the Smithsonian's commitment for implementation of the 1954 Hague Convention. We work closely with organizations, uh, both in the US government and NGOs like the Blue Shield, and we're very proud of this work. So today, I'm very pleased to be joined by three colleagues who are also engaged in advocacy for cultural heritage. Uh, our first speaker today will be Lori Foley, coordinator of the Heritage Emergency National Task Force, uh, and Lori works for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. 
Um, and then uh, she'll be followed by Mary Ruffin Hanbury, president of Hanbury Preservation. And then our third speaker will be Sharon Park, who's associate director, architectural history and historic preservation division at the Smithsonian Institution. So uh, please take it away, Lori. Thank you, Corey, and good morning, everyone. I'm honored to be in the company of such accomplished women. I'll be referring to the Heritage Emergency National Task Force by its acronym, HENTEF, just because it's such a mouthful to say, and just saying it in its entirety can add, I'd say about five minutes to my presentation. So HENTEF is the Heritage Emergency National Task Force. I've been involved in preservation for over two decades providing libraries and archives with advice on preserving their records and collections. As HENTEF coordinator, I now work in that unique space where cultural heritage and emergency management intersect. After decades working in various professions, uh, this is where I found my passion. HENTEF's mission is based on connecting the cultural community with the emergency management community. Each community has a separate vocabulary and different priorities following a disaster. These two disparate communities need to understand each other and work together to protect our, our cultural heritage. Next. When I speak to emergency managers, I feel obliged to remind them that our cultural and historic resources are a link not to our past, but also to the present and future, not only to our past. HENTEF's embrace of these resources is wide and is not just focused on historic preservation. Our nation's cultural and historic resources include the items depicted here and much, much more. Next. I tell emergency managers that cultural and historic resources are held in the public trust by cultural heritage institutions that range from A to Z. These institutions hold the collective history of our communities, our states, our territories, and our nation. They anchor us to our community identity. They educate us. They serve as gathering places for healing and even for cell phone charging. When disaster strikes a community, recovery of these very institutions is vital for the economic, social and artistic life of that community. If these institutions don't recover, the community never fully recovers. Next. HENTEF is a public-private partnership sponsored by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and the Smithsonian Institution, specifically FEMA's Office of Environmental Planning and Historic Preservation and the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative. HENTEF operates in all phases of the disaster cycle, preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. But our largest role is in assisting private nonprofit cultural institutions and arts organizations following a major disaster. Emergency managers are wont to say, all disasters are local. But when a disaster exceeds a state's capacity to provide resources, that state, that territory or that tribe can request assistance from the federal government. And that's when HENTEF steps up to the plate. Next. This list shows HENTEF's 60 members. The 18 federal agencies are shown in red at the top. The 42 national service organizations, private nonprofit professional trade organizations are in black. Among its federal members are the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation and the National Park Service. Its non-federal members represent various sectors, the arts, culture, emergency management, tribal interests, and historic preservation, which is represented by, among others, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Association for Preservation Technology, and the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers. Each federal agency has the ability to support response and recovery efforts. Each private nonprofit member has a network of stakeholders and the ability to push information out to their constituents. Conversely, each has the ability to gather information, such as reports of damage, from their members and pass them along to HENTEF. 
So how does HempTef corral its members to turn advocacy into action? Next. Following a major disaster, HempTef coordinates the collection and sharing of incident-specific information with federal, state, regional, and local entities. When there's advanced warning of an approaching event, such as a hurricane, a heads up preparedness email is sent to the entities listed here. Preparedness tips include, make sure your contact list is up to date. Make sure you have virtual access to procedures that will get your business up and running again. And even the basic advice of monitor the storm. HENTEF can be alerted, alerted to damage suffered by cultural and historic institutions, but their cultural stewards need to be connected with local, state, and federal resources. Following an event, I'll convene a HENTEF coordination call for these entities using the dashboard shown here. This is an opportunity for cultural stewards to share reports of damage with emergency managers. It's an opportunity for emergency managers to recognize the impact of an event on cultural and historic institutions and to provide guidance on how to access their assistance. And these calls connect the state's arts and culture community with resources available from HENTEF's 60 members. Next. HENTEF delivers technical assistance, guidance, and resources. Following Hurricane Irma, legislative records in the US Virgin Islands were badly damaged, as you can see in the left and middle photos. A team of subject matter experts from the Smithsonian and the National Archives and Records Administration was deployed to assess their condition, other than really bad, and to recommend future treatment. On the right, following Hurricane Maria, HANTEF worked with the Department of the Interior, the Smithsonian, the National Archives, the National Park Service, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to bring training in mold removal and health and safety to Puerto Rico's cultural stewards. The workshop was conducted at the Territorial Archives or the Archivo General. And here uh, you see there is no light. There was still no power at the archive when this was taken. Next slide. The Archivo General houses books, manuscripts, photographs, film, video, and audio recordings. The collections include documents and records of the three branches of government spanning the 18th to 21st century. Many documents essential for running the government of Puerto Rico. Hurricane Maria caused construction materials to land on the archives generator, crushing it and rendering it useless. Lack of electricity throughout the island left the archive without air conditioning and the necessary temperature and humidity controls. Windows building wide were completely destroyed. Wind-driven water entered the structure and created the perfect environment for mold growth on everything, furniture, balustrades, and not just the collections. It was a struggle to get a generator a generator to the Archivo when so much effort was being put into life safety and life saving as it should have been. Hentef underscored the importance of attending to the very documents that ensure continuity of government, advocating for their protection and preservation. So the Territorial Archives requested assistance to obtain and install a generator, and it was provided through FEMA and the US Army Corps of Engineers. Just one example of advocacy in action. Next. When responding to an incident, how do we know? How does the local or county emergency manager know which institutions have been affected and which ones have not if the full universe of institutions is not known? HENTEF advocates for the protection of cultural and historic resources by working with states to compile a master list of cultural and historic institutions and arts organizations in that state. GIS coordinate pairs are identified for each site, so a GIS map layer of cultural institutions can be created with the able help of interns working with the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative. Such a map will be helpful in the future for preparedness messaging 
Now we know which organizations could be impacted by riverine flooding, storm surge, and other potential hazards. More importantly, cultural and historic institutions are empowered to recognize potential impact and can prepare accordingly. Next. As I mentioned at the top, HENTEF's mission is based on connecting the cultural community with the emergency management community. In heart, heritage emergency and response training, 25 cultural stewards and emergency managers gain skills and hands-on experience in protecting, evacuating, and salvaging collections. The week-long program is hosted by SCRI in Washington, DC, and taught by Smithsonian subject matter experts. Armed with this knowledge, HART graduates can help spread the love and the information with their organization and with colleagues in their community. We didn't offer this in-person program in 2020, and we'll decide in a few months whether we're going to conduct the program later this year or wait until 2022. So if you're interested in this program, uh, do let us know. Next. Following Hurricane Sandy, the scene on the left was evident throughout the Northeast. However, the scene on the right is perhaps more common. The orange tape around the pile lets debris removal workers know to cart all that stuff away. Following a disaster, the losses most keenly felt are those irreplaceable items that are cherished the most. Photographs, the grandfather clock, grandma's recipes. Although these precious items may be damaged in a disaster, it's often possible to salvage them. Next. HENTEF helps the public salvage treasured possessions in the wake of a disaster by bringing a Smithsonian program called Save Your Family Treasures to select disaster recovery centers or DRCs. At a DRC, survivors can apply for federal disaster assistance, inquire about the status of their application and speak to experts who can help them with recovery. Smithsonian preservation experts can be among those at a DRC. They demonstrate how to safely handle, dry and clean damaged photographs, books, documents, textiles, and other keepsakes. By offering these demonstrations, HENTEF can offer hope to disaster survivors as they literally pick up the pieces of their lives so they can move forward. Listening to the survivors' stories of loss, hope, and resilience is a transformative experience. And the shared humanity is, much, is what makes doing what we do infinitely rewarding. Next. So thanks for joining me in that space where cultural heritage and emergency management intersect. I'm Lori Foley of the Heritage Emergency National Task Force. Now I pass the baton to Mary Ruffin. Good morning and thank you. Um, I'm gonna wait until my slides come up. Oh, there they are. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this panel is we haven't seen our presentations before today. And so I don't know, Lori, if you, you, you in your GIS, you put that North Carolina map and the Country Doctor Museum out there just for me, but I have been to the Country Doctor Museum and it was kind of fun to see all these places in North Carolina where I live highlighted on your map. So thanks for that, Lori. Um, I'm bringing a, a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I think I'm the only person on the panel who's not headquartered out of Washington. I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I'm a private sector CRM uh, professional in Raleigh. Um, but in order to ease that transition out of DC, I, first slide is a picture of Reston. Um, this is the Hickory Cluster by Charles Goodman, which is one of the residential neighborhoods developed in Reston in the 1960s as the new town was expanding, um, and which I had the pleasure of surveying uh, for Fairfax County this past year. Um, as we started this panel, um, we knew it was going to be about preservation. We knew it was going to be about advocacy and the, the title changed a couple times during the planning because I think we've been planning on this for about a year and a half now. We thought we were going to be in person last year. And um, the more I started to think about it, at least in terms of, of my little slice of historic preservation practice, 
is that really all of all of preservation is advocacy. Um, everything we do, it took me a while to, to come to that. And as I give my talk, I'm gonna take you on that uh, journey of how I sort of came to that perspective for this talk. Um, so uh, if we can have next slide. Uh, whenever I'm not really sure what I'm gonna talk about, I try to take one of the key uh, words and whatever the, the panel is and look it up in the dictionary uh, because that seems to sort of spur my thoughts. And so I pulled out the Old English Dictionary, which I love, and it talks about advocacy as someone who supports, recommends, or speaks favorably of another. Next. And the definition um, expands a little bit with all of the etymologies and, and the usage in Norman and Middle French. And there were some really great words. Um, and when I looked at this um, and looked at all of the ways that an advocate was described, I realized that, that all of preservation is advocacy because when you work in preservation, wh whatever part of that uh, huge field that you're in, you are a defender, you're a champion, you're a protector. I, I love the thought of being a professional pleader um, because that's often what I think I am, a counsel, a helper, a supporter, assistant, a mediator, all of those things. I think any of us, whether we work for the government, whether we work for a nonprofit, um, whether we own a historic property or manage one, or whether we work in the private sector in a CRM firm, take on the mantle of all of those different roles of advocacy. Uh, so even though I am not the kind of advocate who um, goes up to Capitol Hill or uh, to the General Assembly in Raleigh or to city council meetings, although I do do that on occasion, it's not a huge part of what I do uh, in my day-to-day -day preservation work. Um, I, in thinking about this panel and thinking about what to say, I've decided that, that all of the work that I do and that people like me do is in some sense advocacy. Next. So in thinking about this, um, my initial thought was that in, in a professional preservation context, advocacy involves working within the parameters and context of programs and projects um, and communities to identify, evaluate and treat resources for their own sake, for history and for the future. So again, a lot of times we're working within historic survey, uh, within um, section 106 review, within the national register. But in all cases, we're advocates. Next. And I'd like to argue that uh, preservation is advocacy for many types of things which are not mutually exclusive. And I've decided that really um, there are four things that we advocate for. We advocate for places, we advocate for stories, we advocate for people, and ultimately we advocate for values. Next. So what I'd like to do is to look at those four different things for which I think we all advocate and give you some examples um, that are specific to the work that I've done, but I'm sure that anybody, again, who is watching this, who works in the field, uh, can take projects and programs they've worked with and um, look at them through the same type of lens and have similar stories. This is um, Saxis. It is a little island town on the eastern shore of Virginia. If you're coming north up that narrow peninsula from uh, Cape Charles at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, you take 13, which is this great road that goes up the spine of the eastern shore, get just to the Maryland border and you turn left and you go as far as you can go and you're in Saxis. Uh, Saxis is technically not an island. There is sort of a causeway there, um, but if it is high tide, and it is a full moon, um, you should check the tide tables because you might not be able to get across the causeway to get to Saxis. And if you do, hopefully there'll be somebody nice there with a hose to wash off the undercarriage of your car because it will be full of brackish water, which will eat all of your hoses. Um, but it is a wonderful little community. Um, not a lot of Native American history, 
but European settlers were there as early as 1661. Currently, the earliest buildings date to about the 1870s, um, which was a time where um, the transition from substance farming to commercial uh, fishing uh, took place. And a great deal of the story of this island is the seafood industry. Uh, depending on uh, when you, what time of year you come, if you go to the city dock, there's huge walls of crab pots lined up waiting for people uh, to, to take them out and go um, crabbing. Um, there are no schools on the island. There's this old school building that's repurposed to town hall. There are no stores. Um, there are a few churches, there are a lot of graveyards, and there are only two places to eat, um, which are both fantastic and have the freshest seafood you can imagine. Um, several years ago, working with a colleague, Penny Sandback, and with a group out of William & Mary, their Center for Archaeological Research, we did a full survey of all of the structures on the island and put it on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, which again, doesn't necessarily mean that it will be preserved, but it gives the people in Saxis something to hold on to uh, as sort of a good housekeeping seal of approval as they seek um, programs and projects that can support their way of life. And really most importantly, because of climate change. Um, this is a coastal community. And as I mentioned, you know, it's sometimes difficult to get there by car. Um, because of climate change and uh, rising water levels. Um, all of these houses where people live are dependent on septic systems. And another foot or so of um, sea level rise, and none of those slots are going to be able to perk or support any kind of sewage system. And no one's really going to be able to live there um, if we don't find a solution to protect this place or to stop uh, sea level rise. Uh, and so having a National Register designation and looking for sources of funding or attention as to why this place should have help is something that the community can carry with them and use to impress people who may not have been there or know anything about it beyond just help us, help us, we're important, we're on the National Register. Um, great project. If you ever go there, uh, there's a great place called Captain E's. And instead of chili cheese fries, they have crabby fries, which are French fries with crab meat and crab dip. It's the most delicious thing you've ever eaten. And every time I left, I went down to the wharf with a cooler and got a bushel of oysters and took them back to North Carolina. Uh, so a great place. And we advocate for them. Next. We also advocate for stories. Um, this is Babcock State Park in Fayette County, West Virginia. Um, an absolutely glorious, um, beautiful place. It was an area that was heavily mined by the coal industry in the 19th century, but by the early 20th century, most of the coal had been depleted. There'd been a, a little narrow gauge railroad through the park um, to a little town that the coal company had established. Um, at the western side of the park near the New River um, and traces of the railroad and that community still remained. But in 1908, it was turned over to a timber company uh, that did a fair amount of timbering. And then after the depression, or right after, during the depression rather, right after the stock market crash, the lumber company had gotten most of what they wanted or could afford to get out of it. And the owner of the lumber company sold the land to the state of West Virginia for a state park. And this is one of several parks in West Virginia and state forests that were developed in part with help from the CCC under FDR's New Deal. Uh, and all of them have wonderful cabins and trails, um, a lot of them using sort of rustic architecture um, that uses stone and unfinished wood to, to make you feel like you're really adventuring in the outdoors. One of the things that's really wonderful about this specific park is that in uh, the nearby town, there was a whole lot of Italian immigrants who were master stonemasons. So um, this wonderful undulating wall and stair that comes from the headquarters building and sort of 
um, drips down the side of the hill uh, to the river where there's also a dam. It's a wonderful place, but the story of these people, these um, folks who were suffering in West Virginia from underemployment um, and poverty, um, when the New Deal came in and provided a chance for people um, not just to get a check, although checks are nice, but to, to, to have a job and a job with dignity and a job that built beautiful things um, that have uh, benefited the community um, to the present day and that are great masterworks of craft is, is a wonderful story and how this park and other state parks in West Virginia fall into the larger story of our country's attempt to, to step out of um, the depression and to, to bring employment and economic vitality back to a suffering country. It's a great story. So we advocate for these stories and these places that tell stories. Next. Um, I talked about how we advocate for people and I, I'm splitting that into to two categories, people of the past and people of the present and future. Um, this is probably one of my favorite projects. This is a house called Abigarlos. Um, it is in my hometown of Portsmouth, Virginia, and it is um, a, what had been an outbuilding of a larger farm a larger plantation uh, owned first by the Wright family and then by the Carney family. Um, as, as, the proper, as the farm you know, was inherited by generations of Carneys and it was um, subdivided, uh, one of the descendants took a, an outbuilding and moved it onto the parcel that she had inherited, the subdivided, this circa 1812 outbuilding. Uh, and the descendant, Lucy Carter Warner, hired a woman named Mary Ramsey Brown Channel to um, preserve it and to expand it. And Mary Ramsey Brown Channel was the first woman in the Commonwealth of Virginia to be a licensed professional architect. And she was actually someone I knew growing up. And I didn't know anything about her except she was this nice old lady that my parents knew until I was working for the State Historic Preservation Office and we were approached to do some research about this house. And suddenly this woman who was, you know, as a woman over 50, you start to become invisible. This woman who just had seemed like this nice old lady was somebody who was a groundbreaking woman. Uh, she uh, went to Randolph-Macon Women's College and got a degree in math. She wanted to go to architecture school at the University of Virginia, but women were not allowed. So she went to Cornell um, and graduated near the top of her class. She came back and worked in private practice for a big firm in Norfolk until she got married. And when she got married, uh, she really uh, slowed down. She, she worked um, as a solo practitioner uh, she did some work uh, at churches. Her father had been an Episcopal bishop and um, mainly domestic work for family friends. Uh, she didn't take on a lot of work because uh, she felt like her most appropriate role was to be a wife and a mother. But she did do this great, um, this great preservation project at Abigarlos. And um, as I mentioned, um, when I worked for the State Historic Preservation Office back in the 90s, we thought we were going to put this on the National Register but the then owner um, yeah, had cold feet. Um, but in doing so, and Miss uh, Brown was still, Miss Channel was still alive, um, found that she had all of her drawings. And the State Historic Preservation Office, our office worked to um, convince her and her family to donate the drawings to Virginia Tech to the Women in Architecture Archive. So all of these drawings are now available to the public. Some of them are scanned. And um, somebody yesterday in one of the presentations talked about preservation being a long arc. Um, some 30 years later, um, as a private historic preservation professional, the subsequent owner contacted me and we finally did get it put on the National Register. But it was a great joy to advocate and to be able to tell the story of this person, Mrs. Channel, and the work that she had done. Next. I think we also, um, advocate for people in the present and by extension the future 
Um, this is the HB Sug Community Center. It used to be the HB Sug School in Farmville, uh, North Carolina, which is Eastern North Carolina. It's a small town in Pitt County. Um, closest big city is Greenville, where uh, East Carolina University is. And the women in the picture on the left is Gwen Moore and on the right uh, is Corey Baker. And they both went to this school when it was a segregated school for blacks only. Um, and when I thought about people, I could have talked about H.B. Sugg, um, for whom the school is named. H.B. Sugg, whose parents had been born in slavery, um, was born in 1885 and one of 13 children who uh, believed in education and uh, often would work uh, at night um, picking cotton so that he could go to school during the day. Um, he went to school, he went to college. He taught at many places until he came to Farmville in 1918 and helped establish this school. Uh, originally, there was a frame Rosenwald school, which has been ripped down. Um, but this school has um, two or three different building campaigns, including in gymnasium um, put, put uh, on the school in the 1950s as sort of an equalization during that period in the South when there was one last hope of the segregationists that maybe if we got nice gyms for black schools, we wouldn't have to integrate. You see a lot of those sort of um, early to mid 1950s improvements to African American schools. Um, the schools did, of course, finally integrate and this um, building was used for a school a little while longer, um, but then was surplused and bought by a church, which is having some troubles maintaining it. And so Gwen and Carrie wanted to get it put on the National Register, first of all, again, so that they could have something to show to the community that this was indeed important, not just because they loved it, but because it had significance that was recognized by the federal government. And um, if you want to talk about advocates, you really should have had um, Carrie or Gwen here. Um, these women have worked tirelessly. Um, and I, I kind of gave them a break on the fee because, you know, I heard their story and I thought it was an important project to work on, but even giving them a break on the fee to do the work, it was a struggle. And I ended up, uh, this is the red, red and black gala dinner. They, um, you know, they cooked a dinner for the community and charged by the plate. And I came and spoke um, in order for them to raise money to then pay me to do the rest of the work. Um, but these are the people, you know, people like Carrie and Gwen. I mean, I, I did a small portion of working with them uh, but those are the people who, who are advocating for this building because they, they know it's important and it's important to their community and it tells a story um, that could be forgotten if it weren't for these places that we look at. Next. And I think really um, all of those things are a way of advocating for values. Um, this is the chapel at St. Augustine's University. St. Augustine's is an HBCU in Raleigh. Um, it has an existing historic district and they have a grant from the Park Service to do restoration in the chapel, which is the oldest extant building. Um, this school was established uh, by a group called the Freedmen's Commission of the Episcopal Church not to be confused with the Freedmen's Bureau of, of the federal government, but right after the Civil War, the Episcopal Church, a lot of the um, Northern missionaries from the Episcopal Church came to the South to establish schools um, because literacy was gonna be important in allowing uh, the newly um, freed African-Americans to, to take a place in society. And so um, St. Augustine's, which started as a normal school, evolved into a, um, a junior college, a full college, and ultimately a university, which, which still serves and still teaches um, here in Raleigh. Um, but it, it has a strong um, history and association with the Episcopal Church. Um, and again, this chapel, which is made from stones that were mined on the site um, and built by students. Um, in the beginning, there was a real struggle between whether this should be a liberal arts institution, sort of a W.E.B. Du Bois sort of orientation or whether it should follow the Booker T. Washington model and be more of a, a, a trade industrial school for, for trades. Um, and students built this church 
and it is just a glorious building. Um, I've got to tell you, I, I go to church, but I haven't been able to be inside my church for a year. And it has been such a privilege to be associated with this project and actually be inside a church building in the past year. Um, the grant was to restore the windows and the pews. And um, as part of this, um, the Park Service noticed that the pews were probably not original. Uh, we made the argument they were historic, that the St. Augustine's wrote the grant and after they'd gotten the grant, they asked me if I would come help administer it. Um, but we found out that the pews were not original, but historic, but we've ended up um, revising and extending the period of significance for their district so that they can do this. Um, so whether the values have to do with craftsmanship, um, like this man from Epiphany Studios, uh, whose, whose group did incredible work restoring these windows, whether the values have to do with um, the Episcopal Church or education or education for African Americans, you know, every project, every place, every story, all these people incorporate values. Um, and in saving these places and advocating for them, um, we're championing those values. Um, and I, I think everybody can come to the same project and work on it and have their own lens and decide which values they're advocating for. But I would argue that they all do. Um, so with that, I, I, will, I will get off my soapbox um, and get ready uh, to turn the panel over uh, to Sharon Park. But I would just close with the fact that, that um, whenever we work in preservation, uh, whether we think we're just filling out a survey form or taking a picture of a building, we're part of a larger advocacy um, movement for these places and the people and the stories um, that they represent about us and about our country. So with that, I'm going to mute and turn over to Sharon. Uh, thank you, Mary Ruffin. I'm going to follow up some of the uh, themes that Lori and Mary Ruffin have presented today. Uh, the tangible results of saving buildings and sites is advocacy in action. So setting policies that advocate the identification and protection of significant historic properties reinforces the identities of culture and peoples of today and in the past. It is the way, as, as Mary Ruffin has said, it is the way of telling our history, all histories, through our buildings, communities, monuments, and even ruins. The result of these policies and various related programs are amazing and show that advocacy for preservation is action. Sometimes it's for basic rehabilitation and sometimes it's for protection of cultural heritage from disasters. So I'm bridging both of those, um, those treatments. Saving culture, saving cultural heritage and historic identity has been a big part of my career in historic preservation. It started during the bicentennial when I was working as a young architect to restore 18th century properties in Virginia. It was a great learning experience for all aspects of preservation from technical issues, as well as necessary funding and advocacy that make projects happen. What I want to showcase today is large scale advocacy that shows definable impacts when you have policies in place that advocate and fund preservation. The three programs I will discuss briefly are seen here, the work of the National Park Service's historic tax credit program, seen here with its thumbnail of the recently restored Robinson Grand Theater in Clarksburg, West Virginia. My advisory work more recently while here at the Smithsonian, when I served as the American representative for eight years to ECROM, the International Center in Rome, whose whole mission is advocacy for preservation through training and disaster support, seen here with workers on site, as well as my work as a grants reviewer for the past 10 years with the U.S. State Department's Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation Grants Program, seen here with Angkor Wat in Cambodia, which has received grant funding in the past. Next. Advocacy starts with strong policies that support understanding why culture is important and gives the tools, training, and funding to actually undertake documentation and preservation. American Preservation Policy through the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, 
set in place a series of programs for survey identification, listing and protecting of buildings and sites eligible for our National Register of Historic Places. Through this policy and their administrative programs, we can tell all of America's stories by preserving individual sites, complexes, and even whole communities. Within this preservation policy is the Secretary of the Interior's standards for the treatment of historic property set in place to guide physical work to protect historic character and materials. And these standards are utilized as a benchmark for grants, tax incentives, and consultative support. It's also a foundational document used here at the Smithsonian. In my 25 plus years at the National Park Service, working in the federal state partnership of the historic tax credit program, we saved thousands of buildings and rebuilt entire communities that needed economic support and development. By adhering to the standards for quality rehabilitation projects, owners and investors were eligible for a 20% tax credit on eligible expenses for income producing properties. Time and again, developers said that without the tax credit, they would have torn down the buildings and started with new construction, thereby wiping out important tangible history. The unique and special historic character of restored buildings benefits from following these standards. Adaptive and restored buildings are used for affordable housing, main street commercial businesses, industrial repurposing, manufacturing centers for new lines of products, farm buildings, educational and entertainment facilities, any commercial use for buildings on the register that are deemed historic. As you can see from these statistics, the fiscal year 2020 at a glance statistics, they are just as impressive um, uh, the National Park Service program continues to be strong and over 1,200 projects were in review last year for an estimated $7.7 .7 billion, now that's billion with a B, of expected investment. Seen here is the iconic Saren and TWA terminal, which languished for years empty and is now a vital lobby and center for the new airport hotel thanks to the historic tax credits. Projects were on a range, as seen in the pie chart, on a range from under $250,000 to over $25 million. And this is a real example of advocacy of the United States being seen in action. Next. The statistics are just as important for the 45 years of the program uh, with over 46,000 properties saved at an estimated value of $109 billion. Featured project seen here is the Liberty Hotel in Boston that utilized a former penitentiary and saved much of the character as seen in the before and after of the lobby, uh, which had been the guard central station for, for uh, monitoring the penitentiary. It should be noted that the prime preservation architectural firm is women owned. So women, as we are seeing in this conference, can be on all sides of preservation. Next. Shortly after moving um, to the Smithsonian, I was nominated by the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation and selected by the State Department to serve at ECROM, an international training and advocacy program in Rome. It has a very long name, the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, and that's exactly what it does. Um, I was the American representative to its council, and based on the model of UNESCO, the member states of ECROM support the conservation of heritage through the training, advocacy, and funding support for preservation. It was developed after World War II and reflected the work of the monuments men who during and after the war identified damaged sites, made reparations to sites, and located many looted items that were returned. The training programs are fantastic, and our moderator, Corey Wegener, uh, was instrumental in setting up the training for the first aid in times of conflict, which has trained many to be prepared to mitigate damage. ECROM, for some time, has had an international alliance with the Smithsonian. Training is also available for dealing with the aftermath of climate disasters. 
While at Ikram, there were devastating earthquakes in Nepal, tsunamis in the Philippines, rising tides and flooding in Europe and elsewhere that Ikram was able to support, some of it with boots on the ground, such as at Kathmandu. The advocacy programs are also strong in identifying and stopping looting of cultural objects, a surprisingly big market fueled by terrorism. And as Carl, Car, Corey mentioned in her uh, brief presentation, she has been working nonstop uh, with um, climate change, um, with conflict, with conservation in times of conflict. So a lot of credit goes to Corey and her team for uh, continuing this work of the ECROM. Looking at the building uh, in Kathmandu, this white building, it's important to realize that many of these advocacy programs have many partners and not one organization can operate fully on its own. This white palace building also received funding and support from the US State Department's Ambassadors Fund, which helps to underwrite restoration and documentation of very ancient and very significant sites. Next. The State Department provides financial support and since 2001, over a thousand projects have been funded. These properties are everything from aqueducts, Roman mosaics, markets, fortifications, cultural objects, museums, etc. Seen here is the Souk market in Aleppo in Syria, so damaged by terrorism, but recently reopened after many partners supported the restoration, including the Ambassador's Fund. It's a great way to showcase America's policy and advocacy for cultural preservation worldwide. So you can see from my experience that every day I see the benefits and know that advocacy is action that results in careful and thoughtful preservation. My work at the Smithsonian in saving and upgrading our own properties is part of following our Secretary of the Interior Standards and our own Smithsonian policies of preservation. By advocating and demonstrating that we adhere to these policies to protect and restore the historic character of our buildings, we are able to balance the need of preservation with revitalization efforts. And as the secretary was speaking yesterday, we are working on the castle, the arts and industries, and a number of other projects here at the Smithsonian. It's important to protect these properties for generations to come. Next. And advocacy in action can be as simple as providing a beautiful entry for persons with disabilities and actually all our visitors with a universal incline walkway that was part of our grand south entrance to the National Museum of Natural History uh, renovation this past few years. So action can be small or it can involve public private partnerships such as the tax credit program or it can be preparing museum administrators to prepare for disasters, or it can be generous funding to rebuild or save world heritage sites. My motto is saving heritage one brick at a time. I have saved a lot of bricks, granite, stucco, glass, steel, and concrete in my career. I'm proud of every project I've worked on and on every organization that showcases preservation. So I thank you all for listening today uh, for all of our talks and to show the work of women in preservation. Um, I have added some contacts for any of you who might wanna know more information about some of these amazing programs uh, that are sponsored um, by the federal government and by private sector. So um, thank you so much and Corey, back to you. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, and we're gonna have a little bit of Q&A now. So um, I'd like to start with a question for all three of the speakers and we'll, we'll start um, in, the, in the presentation order. So starting with Lori Foley, but um, I'd like to first ask, what first drew each of you to the field of cultural heritage preservation? Lori? I was not immediately drawn to it. I kind of backed into it or fell into it um, over the course of, as I had mentioned earlier, of various um, roles and various uh, 
occupation. So I was a, I was a, a publisher. I worked in trade, book trade and manufacturing for 15 years. And so um, I looked at books as mechanical objects, of course, as things to love and enjoy, but I saw the mechanical aspect of that. And that went into, that became um, working uh, or getting a degree, a certificate at the North Bennett Street School in hand book binding, and being able to work at various um, locations to be able to start working on preservation of library materials and archival materials. And at one point, um, I attended a, a, a preservation management course that was offered by a regional conservation center, the Northeast Document Conservation Center on preservation management. And that was there where I learned about um, disaster planning and the importance of, of trying to help or of institutions themselves, helping themselves uh, be better prepared to address uh, any disaster or emergency that comes their way. And so that kind of led to this and that and the other. Um, and I think it was really being involved in trying to help people. Um, it seems that my career has always been kind of pegged to various disasters. So I joined the Northeast Document Conservation Center a week before September 11th. And so some of my first activities staffing the hotline was helping um, individuals salvage things that were covered in um, dust from, from the World Trade Center collapse and then working with people trying to help them salvage their, their, their portraits and listening to their stories um, I mean, I was just blown away by the strength that they've exhibited and through the years. So um, I've really reveled in this in this position and um, I see myself retiring doing this. This is um, where I belong. Thanks, Lori. Mary Ruffin, how about you? Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, I know this is a women in preservation conference, but I have to give a shout out to my dad. Um, he was a preservation architect. Um, and often, you know, if he was driving me into school, he'd say, we just can take a turn here. I want to go look at this project and make sure things are coming along. So I kind of got dragged on a lot of things, but I never really thought I had the chops to be an architect. Um, and so I didn't go into architecture. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do in college. Uh, I was an art history major, but, um, it included architectural history and I had some really great professors. And I think art and architectural history taught me to have a more discerning eye. Um, and I realized I was kind of a visual learner. Um, I was never a really good history student, but when I had objects or things I could look at um, to put and use to contextualize history, I, I understood it a lot better. Uh, so um, I got a, a, a graduate degree in urban planning um, and, and really just sort of fell into it. I, you know. For all of you all trying to enter the job market, um, even though I, I knew I wasn't going to be an architect when I got out of grad school, um, the job market was horrible. So I worked for my dad because he said if he was going to support me, I could at least clean out his flat file drawers. That's when people actually had flat files for, for drawings. Um, so worked for him for a while. But um, my first real job is I got a job for in the regional office for the State Historic Preservation Office for Virginia which was a, a great experience. I was the only architectural historian for the Eastern portion and had to learn all the federal programs and be able to present them and, and had a territory and a turf that I felt like I had ownership from. Um, it was a great experience. I went from there to the National Trust. And then again, you know, I, I wasn't sure when, when the Women in Preservation Conference was, wh whether we were all gonna talk about, you know, work-life balance and that's what this was gonna be about. but. Um, um, moved to Raleigh when I got married because I had a husband with a um, less portable, better paying job and um, never really thought I would work for myself, but um, that seemed to be a place where I could get a good work-life balance. I worked for the Shippo in North Carolina until my child was born um, and, you know, being a, a small business, a lot of flexibility. Um, I'll be leaving early to go to baseball practice this afternoon, uh, but um, it, 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 it's been a, a number of influences, um, you know, parental, um, really good professors in college and grad school, um, and then just getting a good job with some great colleagues at Department of Historic Resources who really uh, were pretty fabulous crew back then. They still are, I'm sure, but, uh, you know, when I worked for them, they were great, um, who gave me a good grounding. Thanks, Mary Ruffin. And Sharon, how about you? 
Uh, yes, thank you. Well, I think it's time and place. You know, I was already a licensed architect when I went to uh, Old Town Alexandria and worked for the Everett, Everett Faber firm uh, from Lynchburg, Virginia, who was doing a lot of uh, restoration work for the Bicentennial. And I really got the bug then because I love the archaeologists, I love the historians, I love the paint analysis, I love the technical aspects. I loved working with the construction crews. Um, I mean, it was the whole panoply of players that made the made the projects just wonderful. And I had a lot of great mentors, all men, uh, who uh, just taught me everything I know. And uh, it was terrific. And they all helped me um, step up um, in my career as I went to the Park Service and then as I came to the Smithsonian. And so it's been, uh, it's been a great journey. And uh, it, it really was the bicentennial, the fact that there were these projects that had to be taken care of. And I was lucky to be on a team to do that. So thank you. Thanks, Sharon. So I'm gonna take some questions from our audience. Um, Lori, we're gonna direct the first question to you. And this is one you get a lot, um, but this is from Elizabeth Ingiani. I hope I said that right. Um, she says, my family was impacted by Hurricane Florence when it flooded the New Bern, North Carolina Historic District. And we had no information or resources to help us restore and save our houses in the immediate aftermath. A lot more damage was done in the attempts to clean up. These are private houses, not institutions like museums or government sites. But with major storms becoming more common, is there help for regular preservation minded people to get information in an emergency um, and uh, to find out about flood mediation companies who have some knowledge of historic structures? Lori. Elizabeth, thank you for your question. So North Carolina happens to have, as Mary Ruffin would be the first to, to say, um, has an extensive um, selection of resources to help the public recover from, uh, from damage resulting from disasters. So I would first look for, and, and possibly when um, Florence hit, you may not, they might not have had as robust a website, but I know over the years, they have added a lot of information about um, helping the public restore their historic houses. Now, um, funding is always an issue and will always be an issue. And the federal government simply does not have the capacity to be able to offer funding for, for that. However, um, working, um, getting to know that community, and I'm sure Mary Ruffin will be able to speak more to this, um, would be really valuable because I, I totally get the fact that there are people lurking who are ready to pounce and take advantage of of people in a dire situation and that happens with every disaster and you wanna make sure that you're asking the right questions and that you're getting what you want. So I'll turn this um, over to Mary Ruffin next. Yeah, I, you know, I would say, um, you know, first, I know New Bern's got a, a pretty robust historic preservation program locally, but a lot of times local government people are pulled I, I, when uh, Lori was talking about Puerto Rico, you, you get pulled to life safety. So even if you've got a great preservation planner, they may be, get pulled to do something else. Um, the State Historic Preservation Office has good resources, and I, I don't think it's the flash place page of their web page, but I do know on the website for the North Carolina Historic Preservation Office, they've got some good resources. They may not have been there at that time. Uh, but I have I have subsequently seen them or seen them recently, um, and I think when emergencies come up, they move that information to the front of their web page. So that is one place to start. It's hard, um, you know. I'm not in the government now, so I can tell anybody anything I want. But when you're in the government, you can't recommend people sometimes per se. But you can have a list of contractors that have have done good work on previous projects, and either through Raleigh or if in Newburn, you'd be out of the Greenville office. So. Great, thanks very much, both of you for answering that question. Um, Sharon Park, I have a question for you. Um, I'd like to know from you, uh, what, what, was, what was the difference in the leadership roles and the advocacy you did when you were at the Park Service versus where you are now at the Smithsonian? Uh, 
<laughs> well, that's a great question. Um, it's being on two sides of the table. So at the Park Service, uh, being the head of the Historic Tax Credit Program and also the technical publications, and I will mention for the previous person about New Bern, um, the Park Service has a really good set of preservation briefs, many, of course, which I've worked on, and uh, they do have assistance for how to dry out buildings after after flooding. And so they have a lot of technical material that can be helpful to the general public. But as the head of the tax credit program um, and implementing the standards and certifying projects that uh, had met the threshold for being quality rehabilitation projects, um, I was really sort of like the judge. And at the Smithsonian, I'm like in-house counsel. So, um, I have to meet, you know, the goal is to always meet the, the standards and to get your projects approved. And the Smithsonian still works closely with the DC State Historic Preservation Office and with the Commission of Fine Arts and um, our partners at the National Capital Planning Commission to get approval to have these projects go forward. So in one, I'm certifying everything. In the other, I'm meeting, meeting all the standards. So it's, it's a different role, but the goal is still the same for both. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Sharon. Um, so in a, in a response to the question a few minutes ago, Elizabeth says, websites don't help when you have no power, which is very true. But this is where Lori Foley and I will say, that that's why if you live someplace where you kind of have an idea that it's not if you're going to be hit by a natural disaster, but when, um, that you make sure that you have that kind of information available. Um, Lori and I often use the, the old phrase, um, when the house is on fire or underwater is not the time to start exchanging business cards. You need to have that information about your emergency plan, about your emergency contacts, who's your go-to um, mitigation company, who's your go-to, you know, who's going to help you muck out your basement before you get into trouble. So that's that's my adv advice, my free advice for the day. <laughs> um, so we have time for a few more questions. Um, let's see. I was going to direct one back to Lori, and that's um, what what response was there um, for the derecho that happened across Iowa recently? And I know you were very involved in gathering information for that, Lori Foley. Yes, um, the derecho was something that was sort of out of the blue. And um, Hentef worked very closely with Iowa's state cultural agencies and actually convened a, a HENTEF coordination call with state cultural agencies, as well as with emergency managers uh, at the state and federal level and put these two communities together to start talking about what the damage was on the cultural heritage side and how the state and federal governments can assist them. So uh, that was something that was um, quite an effective response in that uh, the Iowa State Cultural Agencies worked very well together and were very willing to reach out to the cultural stewards to say, here's how you can help. Here are some connections. Oftentimes, when you go to a state emergency management agency's website, you, you can't find the warm body that you want to ask of a person, the person that you want to ask a question to. So they were very willing to share their contact information and, and reach out any way they want. And building those relationships, I think, is really helpful because I had been in touch with um, some of the folks in Iowa State Emergency Management Agency prior to that. So just having that relationship is really wonderful to help move response and recovery forward. Thanks, Lori. Um, Mary Ruffin, I had a question for you um, about your work with, with the, um, the places slide that you had at first, this small community that's you know, gradually um, in, encountering the problems of climate change. And I was wondering if there are any um, specialist organizations for architects, preservation architects, et cetera, that specifically deal with climate change um, as their specialization. Well, I know that there, um, there is a um, 
And now, since you've asked me this, the name has gone out of my head, but um, there have been a series of conferences in Nantucket and in St. Augustine and in Annapolis, I think it's called History Underwater. Um, Lisa Craig, uh, Lisa Bertram Craig has been involved with that and Leslie Keyes in St. Augustine and um, I think Newport is doing some work. Those would be the places I would look because there are people who are looking at how to address it from a policy perspective in terms of, you know, trying to stop global warming, but also um, how you deal with um, how you deal with mitigation, whether it's dikes and dams and, you know, that kind of thing, or whether you lift buildings, which is controversial in terms of sometimes lifting buildings up on raised foundations. Um, where I'm from originally in Norfolk, Virginia, you've got the world's largest Navy yard. Um, which is, so in that case, the military has been very involved in Tidewater and saying, you know, we've got a huge physical investment, not only for the current operations in the military, but there's some great historic resources at the Navy base, including a great ball field that Ted Williams played in uh, during World War II when he was uh, stationed there briefly. So there's some great, places and and they realize that there's an investment so i would i would look at the history underwater group um which seems to be the great nexus for um they have a conference i think every other year and bring in specialists uh lisa craig leslie keys there are probably others but those are the names that i that i know i don't know that anyone has um a silver bullet however yeah what is Sharon, the, the do you right have thing? any other thoughts on that um, well, I've, I uh, second everything that Mary Ruffin has said, and um, we're look, even even the Smithsonian is looking at what what you can do with uh, flooding, and of course we have more uh, major investments with um, flood walls and uh, but Independence uh, Constitution Avenue in Washington, D.C. is the low, the low point in the city that takes all the water and the National Archives were flooded and they developed a series of uh, hydraulic gates. And um, so there are some techniques, but as Mary Ruffin says, the raising of um, uh, buildings up on foundations does change their character and their scale and it's still controversial. Um, uh, a lot of the communities, Charleston and others, are looking at ways to protect their resources, partly because so much of, of it is tourism. And if the buildings are gone or the industries are gone, um, a lot of the economic viability of these communities is gone. So it's a big issue, and I think we're going to have to be studying it more. Association for Preservation Technology International, which is one of the partnership groups in many preservation. They had a big uh, issue um, uh, two years ago and looked at uh, climate change so and impacts to historic resources from flooding. So there are some articles out there. Um, I, I, would, I would just, one other thing that I would say is a lot of times um, those situations disproportionately affect communities of color and low to moderate income communities. Um, and there's a landscape architect named Kofi Boone who's done some work about that, um, looking at a town in Eastern North Carolina called Principal. Um, but when the National Trust set up their offices in Katrina, in New Orleans after Katrina, I went to help set up that office. And again, um, you found that uh, historically, um, people who were affluent, sorry, I'll let it go. and dogs have an opinion as well. Um, so we had a, a couple of other questions in the chat that I wanted, or in the Q&A that I wanted to address. One is, can you provide a general list of resources to provide for our, for us to provide for our communities? And I'll say, um, you have the Cultural Rescue Initiative um, email, or sorry, uh, website address in the chat. And that includes a lot of information that is put out by the HENTEF. And so if you um, do the pull down menu at the top of the Cultural Rescue Initiative website, you should be able to find resources for communities and also for just um, private citizens about how to deal with the saving your family treasures issues, et cetera. 
Um, there was also a question about how can cultural heritage professionals who are unaffiliated with institutions contribute their expertise and assist communities, institutions, and or individuals with disaster recovery? Well, I, th I think um, some of that, if you're a cultural heritage professional, I would first check with your professional organization. So for example, um, the American Institute for Conservation uh, has the uh, National Heritage Responders Program, and that's a volunteer program where you can help with um, disaster recovery questions from small institutions. And, and they also deploy people, um, not just conservators, but also certain collections managers, registrars, et cetera, to go and assist um, institutions in disasters. Um, uh, the uh, other organizations have usually some kind of disaster risk management wing, like um, the American Alliance of Museums is part of the HENTEF, so they're paying attention to what's going on with museums and disasters, et cetera. Lori, I thought you might have a little bit more to add, and then we're going to have to call it a day. Right, very quickly. Um, the Alliance for Response Networks, which are administered by the Foundation for Advancement in Conservation, um, AFR, uh, they have 37 networks around the country, and if you are near one, um, you can certainly get involved and engaged, um, and that's a really valuable uh, tool, both for you to gain um, information, but also to be able to offer assistance as well. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Thanks so much for your participation, for all your questions, and thanks to the audience for tuning in today. And we'll close with that.